Nigerians going to the polls for a crucial presidential vote that will see the country's next leader elected. The hotly contested poll is being held simultaneously with voting for representatives for the country's parliament. Polls open in Nigeria on Saturday morning in what will be Africa's largest democratic exercise. About 93 million Nigerians in a country of 20, uh, 200 million people are registered to vote, according to electoral body, the INEC. But only 87 million are holders of a permanent voter's card, a PVC, a main requirement to cast a ballot. More than, according to information, equally, uh, we are having that three main candidates are in the running. Political kingmaker Abola Tinubu of the ruling all Progressive Congress, the APC, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, and businessman Peter Obi of the Labour Party, arguably the most interesting uh, newcomer in the race by law or candidates who need at least 25% of the votes in the, at least 24 of Nigeria's 36 states to win. In the past, Nigeria's elections have essentially been two-party affairs with power uh, mingling between the uh, ideologically in this that in this uh, APC and the PDP. What has uh, that mattered has been the religious and ethnic balance at the top of each party's tickets, a semi-official rotation of power that works to manage uh, sectarian. Uh, sentiment. Stay with us as we examine today's uh, elections taking place in Nigeria on the Pan-African debate. Hello and thanks for joining us uh, this day on your Pan-African television at Freak Media. We are looking at Nigeria's election and uh, Nigerians going to the polls today to decide who will be the country's next president in what uh, observers have described as the hotly contested elections. No matter whoever wins the election, equally uh, analysts say who will have to deal with the present situation the country is facing, re uh, considering including insecurity, uh, economic crisis, as well as other issues in place. This is the Pan African debate. Thanks for joining us today on the program. We will be pleased to hear from you. Those of you watching us by Facebook, we will equally like to read from you. Leave us your comments on our Facebook page. We'll read them here during the program. You can as well uh, call us when the lines will be open for you to call us and share with us your opinion. And who do you think will win in Nigeria's elections holding today? Uh, according to information, about 20, uh, 200 million Nigerians. Of course, in the 200 million population, 93 million are expected to cast their ballots today. I'll be hearing from those uh, journalists in Nigeria and equally uh, listening to uh, guests who are equally on Zoom this afternoon. Let's begin with you, Mr. Elijah Nwoku. You are a researcher uh, with Leeds University. It's a pleasure having you on the program this afternoon, Mr. Elijah. <laughs> We are not getting the feedback from you. Uh, just hoping that our technicians work on that to make sure that we're able to get the sound from you. And Mr. Elijah, once again, let's try to see if we can re-establish connections with you, Mr. Elijah. Can you hear me now? Yes, all is fine now, Mr. Elijah. I'm sorry. Um, my microphone was off. Uh, as I was saying, uh, it's an exciting day for Africa, not just Nigeria. We are talking about a uh, populous nation in Africa. And we are talking about the giant of black Africa as a whole. And um, whatever happens in Nigeria is not going to stay in Nigeria. It carries ripple effect all over Africa. So um, all of us, we are monitoring, we are watching, seeing what's happening on social media, on the internet, on TV. We're talking to Nigerians on the ground. We're seeing what's happening. We're hoping for peace in Nigeria, first and foremost, because that's quite very, very important. We don't want chaos in that the world because if there's chaos in Nigeria, it's not going to end in Nigeria. It's going to be, the spillover is going to be all over West Africa and even including Cameroon as a whole. So um, we're hoping for peace in these elections and whoever wins, uh, we hope that it will be for the better of Nigeria. And uh, again, 
it's a gigantic election, so we're going to be talking about the ups and downs and things that are happening there. But uh, as a preamble, we just want peace and prosperity for Nigeria. That's what I can say from the onset. Wish of every African, especially Nigerians as well, uh, Africa's uh, biggest democratic exercise holding in Nigeria. We equally have uh, uh, Mr. Tulu Mani, uh, Tuluwa Mini. At DFI is an economist. Mr. Tulu, it's a pleasure having you on the program. All right, uh, Mr. Timothy, we have equally uh, Mr. Timothy, Doc Percy. Uh, you are uh, with the Department of Philosophy, Veritas University, and you join us from Abuja. Welcome to the program, Mr. Timothy. Thank you for having me. It's glad having to reconnect with you during our moment of democratic uh, 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 consolidations, which is the point of realizing where we are going from here and where we hope to be. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you equally for coming. We are expecting to uh, establish connections with Mr. Gabriel Sukio. He's a lecturer with Achievers University in Owo, Nigeria, and hoping Mr. Gabri uh, joins us equally during the program. We're expecting equally Mr. Uh, Tuluwamini at DFR to join us. We're equally expecting uh, to join us is uh, David Ondein, a journalist equally from Nigeria. Uh, but right away, let's begin with you, uh, Mr. Elijah Inwoku, you are a researcher with uh, Leeds University on Africa Development. Nigeria's election, uh, biggest uh, demo, uh, that's the biggest exercise happening in Africa at the moment. All eyes, like you had earlier mentioned, are focused on Nigeria and all we're expecting is a peaceful outcome. Uh, from since uh, campaigns were launched up to now, what has been your observation? And can we say today's exercise can actually, uh, you know, bring out that outcome which we're expecting as peaceful um we uh, since the election started in nigeria um i've been in different forums and different platforms so we've had this discussion about how the elections are going on in nigeria and what africa can learn as a whole uh, first and foremost i want to say that um on a nutshell i mean from a democratic perspective i would think that nigeria has gone far yes uh, we are seeing a, lot, a couple of um, issues here and there. We are seeing uh, people being prevented from voting because of hoodlums. Uh, we are seeing um, some candidates not um, having their, their representation on the polling station. But in a nutshell, Mr. Lewis, I would say that Nigerian election is going on in a way that we expect in Africa free unfair i mean when we say free and fair it's relative because somebody listening to me will say what do you mean i mean somebody in lagos who's seen a couple of things here would say what do you mean by free and fair when this we are talking be on, talking about on average there is no election even in the united states even here in canada even all over the world that you're not going to have hitches here and there you're not going to have pockets of issues happening all over for elections, but in a nutshell, when you evaluate an election to say it is free people exercise their vote, you're talking on a general scheme and say, if you take into consideration the irregularities that happened in that election, and you threw that into the mix, into the statistics or whatever happened at that, would the outcome have changed? That's what we look at when we talk about elections. Would the outcome have changed? And if the answer is no, then you say the elections were free. So from looking at the way things have been going in nigeria from the time people are going to you know getting their pvc which is their voting card in some countries we call the voting card in some countries they use um national identity card but in nigeria they use what they call the pvc from the point where people are able to access their own pvc where you do not have a massive hindrance put in front of them and hindering them from getting their voters card up to the point where people are mobilized they are able to you know, express the opinion on TV, on social media, on all other platforms freely, free of intimidation. The moment where people are, you know, able to cast that vote, 
up to the moment where the electoral body is able to declare whoever comes out without intimidation from either those in the ruling party or those who want to fraud election here and there without undue intimidation on a not looking at that we could we would say nigeria election so far has been going on in a way that was at the end of the day we can say the elections are credible they will be credible and whoever becomes the winner it will be a credible election and it'll be a lesson for a lot of african countries francophone countries anglophone countries we saw how, what happened in kenya that we talked on this platform some time ago that we could say that was a credible election so africa is on the right path and i think that if this trend continue on this trajectory we would say that we could see democracy being a reality on, on in africa so we are watching and hopefully at the end of the day we could sit here and say it was a good election for nigeria and whoever becomes the winner is a representation of the aspirations of the people of nigeria Thank you much mr elijah inoko uh, let's hear from you mr uh, Timothy Dokpasi, uh, you are with the Department of Philosophy, Veritas University, and join us from Abuja. Mr. Timothy, you're on ground in Nigeria. What's your observation? And uh, let's begin to find out from you. Did you cast your ballot this morning? And uh, what did you observe as uh, other Nigerians equally went to the polls today to decide who would definitely be the president in your country? Please, you might have to put on your microphone. We cannot get the feedback from you, please. OK, can you hear me now? Sure. Yeah, so thank you for having me. Uh, I casted my vote this morning. And uh, I had to travel down to Kaduna to cast my vote, where I registered for my voter's card. And uh, as I cast my vote this morning, I want to let you know that um, for me, this is the dawn of a new day in Nigeria. This is a dawn of a new day for genuine democracy. This, for me again, like I said, even though officially we have had the best of democracy, but there is never a time in this country where democracy has gone to this stage where we can begin to clap and say, yes, INEC is doing so well. But again, it is not over until, it's, until, it's, until it is over. We have been going through social media from what we have been getting from um, from our, our national TVs, it is obvious that there are, there are certain people who want to hijack the process. It is, it is it, we, are, we are hearing cases of intimidation. We are hearing cases of ballot snatching. We are hearing cases of hoodlums who are who have been uh, engaged to sabotage the whole democratic process. But again, again, for the very first time in, in Nigerian history, we are witnessing the proactiveness of the Nigerian military. We are witness, witnessing the proactiveness of the Nigerian police. We are witnessing the proactiveness of active participants in the political game. And so to say, it is, it is, it is really a welcome development for Nigeria. <clears throat> it is a welcome development for Africa. It is a welcome development for the world at large. Because Nigeria has been a country that has gone through a lot of democratic sabotage. And uh, for us to get to this stage, it therefore means that we are responding to democratic formation. It therefore means we are responding to democratic principles. It therefore means we are responding to, to democratic calls for us to be among the committee of nations. And I, I think uh, at this point, I will say that we are moving forward. And like my distinguished senior researcher have just made it clear, uh, I, 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 this is the way to begin and this is the way to go. And if we, if, we, if we put this in check like this, I, I think uh, President Muhammadu Buhari, who has been criticized, who has been ca called all forms of names, if all goes well, I think this will be a period where we shall forgive him all his sins for the past atrocities we have done. And, and, uh, <laughs> and then hopefully we can now begin to say, yes, he is indeed a, a Democrat. Thank you very much. Alpha. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Timothy, and uh, thanks for that reaction. And uh, joining us equally is Mr. Tuluwa Nimi Adeyefa. You are uh, an economist and you're joining us certainly from Nigeria. Mr. Tulu, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Sure, exactly. Today is voting day. And I uh, want to know, get your, your, your experience and uh, tell us what's your observation on ground? 
Okay, uh, there have been mixed reports about the voting in some areas here in Lagos, Nigeria. The electoral officers came on time and voting commenced. In fact, in some places, voting has ended. You know, according to the INEC chairman, the voting was supposed to take place between 8.30 and 2.30. So we've seen voting counted in some areas. Well, unfortunately, there has been cases of violence in other areas within within Nigeria. We've seen that in Bayelsa State, even Lagos State. And there are places where we don't even have electoral officers yet, and voting should have closed. So it's, it's been a mixed situation, from my opinion. And we can always do better. We shouldn't have to have, you know, all these kind of cases of... <coughs> they don't complete the election yet. Yeah. They don't the election Instances like that. So uh, we can't say it's too early to say yet, mm -hmm. but from reports, it's been mixed. In some places, it has been free and fair, peaceful, while in other areas, there has been you know, incidents of violence. All right. Uh, Mr. Tulu, what we want to find out is uh, 8.30 to 2.30 p.m., does this uh, time border Nigerians? Is it uh, short from your evaluation? Uh, can everybody in Nigeria be able to, we know that about 98 million are supposed to cast their ballots. Do you think this time it's convenient enough for everybody to have, you know, to be able to cast their ballots within this period, 8.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m.? So, you know, the way elections work in Nigeria is there are polling units. So, there are about 170, 180,000 polling units spread across the country. So in terms of how short or how long the time is, it, it also depends on the number of, uh, of as an electoral officers in those areas. I mean, I, I saw reports of the police that have about 1,000 registered accredited voters, and you have just one or two electoral officers handling those two. Of course, in that kind of area, the timing is short. So uh, my answer to that question would be that depending on the resources available to cater to people, you know, if you have a polling with 1,000 people, I have about 10 to 12 INEC officials. Of course, everyone will be able to vote because depending on the resources available. But the fact that in some areas, electoral officers are not getting there on time, they come later, you expect people to vote within that short period. It shows probably terrible planning, in my opinion. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Tu. Let's get back to you, Mr. Elijah. Your daily highlighted the fact that Nigeria's election is important to Nigerians and to every African now. Uh, and you highlighted equally the elections in uh, Kenya and uh, now Nigeria, which of course is unfolding peacefully and calmly. Now, how important is the election in Nigeria to Africans and what has been changing over time? We look at past elections and look at what is happening presently from Kenya to now Nigeria. We've seen the process unfolding uh, calmly. Yeah, um, the elections in, in Nigeria, uh, they are a precursor to a lot of things in Africa. I mentioned Kenya, for example, and now we're having a case of Nigeria. Uh, let's put this in perspective. You are talking about a country that is over 200, uh, 200 million people. Yeah. And number two, you are talking about a country that is 40% of the population of Nigeria is below the poverty level. That's the United Nations Development Index. It's numbers that are verifiable. We are talking about a country that is the highest product, producer of oil and gas in Africa. We are talking about a country that has one of the potential to be the highest production of agricultural products, but is one of the worst because the infrastructure and the facilities are not there. You are talking about a country with enormous potential. It doesn't matter what metric you're going to use to compare Nigeria. We are talking about a country that can beat Apart from uh, 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 Democratic Republic of Congo, that's the richest country in the world in terms of resources, there's no other country after that that can compare to Nigeria in terms of natural resources and the ability to become an economic juggernaut of the world. So this is what we are talking about here. So whoever becomes the president of Nigeria, in fact, I want to talk about two things here because the expectations are huge. Whoever becomes the president of Nigeria is going to have a heavy soldier on him. He's going to carry the burden, the expectation of the people. Whether it's Obi or Atiku or Tinibu or whoever, whoever becomes the president knows that the expectation of the people is huge and Africa is looking up to Nigeria to take the bull by the horn. We've seen social media, we've seen celebrities, we've seen, in fact, uh, I think Mr. Timothy mentioned about uh, President Buhari, Muhar, uh, uh, Buhari 
In fact, we've seen so far, if we go by some of his pronouncements, we've seen a president that is ready to stay out of whatever the result come out. We've, we've seen that. He's made a lot of declarations that even though he's a president and he's a, you know, he represents APC, he is going to do everything that the election become free, fair, and whoever wins become the president of Nigeria. That is what we expect from incumbent, incumbent president all over Africa, that the president should not be the one to manipulate that his party wins. The president should not be the one to use the apparatus of the state to intimidate, to make sure that the candidate of his choice wins. We expect former president to act in this manner. Free and fair elections, and we have seen that so far from Mohammed Buhari, and, you know, like uh, Timothy said, we give him credits for that. And at the end of the day, the election is still going on. We are monitoring, we are waiting, we are hoping that his pronunciation matches with words and nobody, you know, frauds the elections and become uh, the winner. Meanwhile, he's not the aspirations of the people. So again, yes, Nigeria carries a lot on its soldiers in terms of what happened in Africa. Not just Africa, black Africa particularly because Nigeria is the, you know, <clears throat> they are the, the, the leader when it comes to leading the black world. It's Nigeria. There's no other country in the world that represents the aspiration of black people in the world. Even in the yeah. United States, the population of black people in the United States is not up to the population of black people in Nigeria. So again, Nigeria represents a lot to sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa is just another code word for black Africa. So I would just call it the way it is. So again, we are watching this election. We are hoping that Nigerian election goes on free and fair, and whoever wins represent the aspirations of the people of Nigeria. Whoever wins should represent the aspiration of the people of Nigeria. Thank you very much, Mr. Elijah. And uh, joining us equally is Mr. Gabriel uh, Asukwo, you are a lecturer with Achievers University of War. Mr. Gabriel, uh, it's a pleasure having you on the program. Uh, please, you have to put on your microphone, please. Switch on your microphone. All right, go ahead, Mr. Gabriel Ashuko, lecturer with Achievers University. Welcome to the program. We have in difficulty in uh, getting clear connections with you. Mr. Uh, Gabriel, maybe you might need to change your, your, your earpiece and uh, maybe uh, reconnect with us. So that we can get clear feedback from you. Uh, now let's get back to you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tulu. Just like Mr. Elijah highlighted, whoever wins this election uh, definitely has a lot on the, his uh, shoulders. No matter who wins, the challenges will definitely be immense. Uh, and equally, we have to find a way to repair a divided country to stop a rampant insecurity, to reboot the economy, and inject equally a sense of confidence and hope in uh, a country highly uh, populated with majority being young people. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tulu, economically speaking, whoever wins election has a lot to do. And uh, we're not just looking at the win, but looking at the responsibility and the challenges that lies ahead. Do you think the three candidates are sat now? Who is, uh, is there anyone that you think will be able to, you know, soldier this responsibility which uh, are awaiting them at the end of uh, uh, this exercise and when they take office, Mr. Tulu. If I get your question, you are saying which of the candidates can, you know, soldier the economic responsibilities ahead? Yes, exactly, Mr. Tulu. Okay, uh, so from their campaigns and manifesto, they all give their points and what they will do. So the, it's what we've heard in the past, but about how they would, you know, diversify the economy, improve the tax base, improve social welfare. But uh, like the other speaker mentioned, we're at a precarious position. Nigeria's debt level is rising rapidly. At some point earlier in the year, we were spending about... 70% of our revenue on debt servicing. Like uh, he also said, the Nigeria is the poverty capital of the world today, unfortunately. So among all the three candidates, they've all given their plans on what, to, on what they would do to, you know, 
ameliorate our condition. But uh, I wouldn't say I would. It, it's still I'm still undecided about which candidates can actually pull things off. Although for most of the youths in my generation and all, uh, and on social media, Peter B seems to be the man based on what he was able to do in the number of states. You know, in terms of the savings he was able to leave back in office in a country where you know government borrows, borrows and spends so much. He was able to leave a substantial form for his, you know, for his successor. So, uh, in my opinion, the responsibility that lies ahead for anyone that wins the election from an economic point of view, the subsidy on petroleum, that has to go. And unfortunately, that would also mean more problems for Nigerians because petrol is the is the driver of what we do, PMS. You know, you want to go to car, you want to go to your office, you want to move around transportation, you want to do this or that. And... There have been four queues and scarcity in the last three or four months. So anybody that comes in eventually has to take away that subsidy because the money spent on that subsidy can be prudently used to develop other sectors of the economy like education, healthcare, and infrastructure. So it's not going to be an easy task for anyone. You know, the the major candidates are three of them. That's Ashiwaju, Bola, Metinimbu, uh, P former governor of Anambra State, Peter B, former vice president of Nigeria, mm -hmm. Tipo Abaka, they all came up with different plans. But uh, like most people of my generation, I think Peter B is still the man because of his track record in the past mm -hmm. in terms of cutting the cost of governance. But let's keep our fingers crossed. All we can hope for is that no, no matter who, who emerges eventually, it shouldn't be as... The economic performance should not be as bad as the... Incumbent presidents who, you know, everyone lost, everyone has lost hope in the man. Like in the last eight years, the the economic situation has turned out for the worst. Name whatever you name the debt service, the exchange rates, the economic growth, the level of unemployment has increased. So uh, it's, I'm still, like I said, I'm still undecided about who can actually do it, but I'll be tilting towards Peter. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tulu. Uh, now, you're going for Peter Obi, but many say uh, he failed in the, actually resolving the security crisis uh, while he was governor. But then, that's your opinion. Now, uh, let's talk with you, Mr. Uh, Timothy. 18 candidates are running, but three are most popular, and those are the three we're looking at this uh, uh, this afternoon, and all eyes are fixed on them. Uh, to you, amongst these three persons who are... Uh, you know, vying for the top job in Nigeria. Do you see any of them who is able to resolve the crisis in Nigeria, economically, security, and uh, this the, the, the crisis that, uh, of course, Nigerians are facing right now? Do you think, uh, do you see any of them being able to resolve these issues? Yeah, I want to first of all correct an impression. Uh, uh, we have four candidates that are predominantly in this race, and uh, don't undermine Konkwaso, please. Okay. I don't want you to undermine Konkwaso because uh, it's, it's the force to reckon with. Okay, and no so, <laughs> you, no and, and no what, what I like yeah. to know, Konkwaso is going to be a game changer in this whole process. So we need to we need to put on we, uh, we need to be on alert on you in, in, in that in that regard. Yeah. Now you see, you see, anybody I'm going to be voting for or anybody I've voted for is just a risk. It's a risk because you see, politicians be what they are have 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 have, have a way of you know you know this whole idea about rhetorics. This is how high about you get a blueprint, you write down economic policies, you write down stuff. You know, we've had that at the, in the past. But what is more important is the fact that, of course, how do we judge them? We judge them based on past records. Uh, but again, uh, judging based on past records is not a determinant factor because it's not a determinant factor to determine the future. Because this is politics. I, I mean, politics is different from when you get into the business completely. I, I give you a clear, a clear case of President Muhammadu Buhari. You can remember that Nigerians were busy clamoring for Buhari when he contested for elections because he had failed three times. I know fully well that Buhari had done something in the past. He was, he, you know, war against corruption during the time of Buhari. There, there, there was this issue of a, a, a war against indiscipline. So a lot of people had hope that if Buhari comes into power, a lot of things were going to change. And of course, within the first two months of his uh, of his administration, we saw a bit of changes. But again, the question is, what later what, what later happened? We, one cannot really tell what later happened. Uh, and of course, we also heard that there were, there, were, there were a group of cabals in the whole system that turned Buhari up. Because if you look at what Buhari is doing now, 
If you look at uh, the way and manner he has been able to put a lot of things in place for us to have a credible election, now you begin to wonder what happened in the in the last eight years of Buhari's administration. Where were these? Where were where were where were his economic policies? Where were his uh, his welfareist ideological practices that he gave that like he put before Nigerians that he was going to change every system? Your idea about change? Where did it come? So I, I do not want to begin to speak to say I do not want to begin to say that uh, Peter Obi is going to give us the best country in the in the world or that Peter Obi is going to be the best. The point is when I went to vote, I went to vote for lesser evil. From my own perspective, I want to vote for a lesser evil because voting for a lesser evil here will mean that uh, I have looked at Atiku, I have looked at uh, 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 Tinubu, I have also looked at Kwankwaso, and I think that uh, based on how the, the candidates have presented themselves to the public, one will not think, now one will think otherwise, not for any reason, but to what? Uh, go for Peter Obi. But again, should Peter Obi disappoint me tomorrow? I will still not be surprised because Peter Obi is a human being. Peter Obi might not know the kind of cabals he's going to meet in Asoro. Peter Obi might not know the kind of system he's going to meet as he advances into the presidency. Should he become the president? Should he become the president? We do not know. So at this point, I will not want to conclude. I will just wait and see. But have it at the back of your mind that is on record for me to say that I will not be disappointed if Peter Obi decides to change the narrative or not. But in fact, I will be disappointed if he does change the narrative because one will now begin to say, yes, we have our vote did not go in vain. I, I'm going to be sincere with you. I'm going to be playing with you. I voted Peter Obi as a person because that is the choice of my candidate. After verifying, after doing a lot of research about other candidates, I decided to go for Peter Obi. But be that as it may, like I said, it's a lesser evil for me. But now, whether he is going to change the narrative, whether he is going to bring some level of transformation in the polity, that I do not know until we see Peter Obi getting the ball running. We are waiting for his economic policies. We are going to be waiting for his for his social uh, 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 social. Uh, uh, how dividends of uh, his democratic uh, 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 dividends that uh, is going to be given. So there are a lot of things we need to we, we, we'll be looking at. And, 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 and like I said, I, I do not want to say anything now, but whoever is made the president of this country, like uh, my distinguished senior researcher observed, a lot of load such a candidate will be carrying. And uh, it will be unfortunate, it will be unfortunate that if such person emerges, uh, he does not in any way meet to the yearnings of Nigerians, then it will be unfortunate that such will only be an unmitigated disaster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Timothy. You voted for a lesser evil, and we take that into consideration. Now, we are still hoping to re-establish connections with Mr. Gabriel. I don't know if he is there yet. Mr. Gabriel? It's like we're still having difficulty in uh, connecting with Mr. Gabriel. Uh, now, Mr. Elijah, uh, 2015, uh, President Buhari was voted into office to handle the country's uh, insecurity challenges, but many fa think uh, he failed in uh, realizing that project which was handed to him by Nigerians in 2015. Looking at the list of uh, the three, uh, Timothy said we should add a, a, a fourth person to the list of the three or the popular uh, faces who are expected to be voted into the, 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 the countries uh, or for the country's top job. Now we look at the persons who are uh, presenting themselves to be Nigeria's president and these challenges which are at hand. Do you think any of them is able to resolve the country's challenges which are presently, you know, expecting <coughs> to be resolved? Okay, let's go a little bit gradually. Let's go from the economics. When you look at the economy of Nigeria, we're talking about a gigantic economy. Uh, I think that Mr. Tulu mentioned about the request from the IMF that Nigeria should get rid of the subsidy, that the, uh, the petrol subsidy. It is going to be a pain on the population of Nigeria. Nigerian people sometimes, they are not aware of what it's going to take to take Nigeria to where it is supposed to be. 
is Peter Obi, Atiku Abubaka, Jagaban, or Kwang Paso, or any of them, are they ready to take the bull by the horns to remove the petrol subsidy? Because this is a two, a double edged sword. It is going to be a pain on the people and the same people that are clamoring and say, Oh, we want Peter Obi, we want Atiku, we want Jacoban, we want Kwankoso, we want this, we want that. If that person comes and take the drastic measures to say, we are going to go by what the IMF, IMF is recommending, and we're going to remove the petrol subsidy, are they ready to go through the pain? That is the question that every ordinary Nigerian should be asking themselves. Number two, Nigeria, as we stand right now, the debt service ratio stands at 36.8 percent what that means is if the government is going to recover the economy or going to have some sort of a productivity the economy they are going to cut a lot of social services in order to reduce that debt servicing ratio which means that they're going to cut social services in different areas that are going to affect the people on the on the other end but Globally, it's going to help the economy. Do people understand? Gentlemen, can some of you mute your, your this thing? There's a lot of noise in the background. So, are the people understanding? Do they understand that what they are asking for? They should be able to bear the burden at the same time because it's going to be painful. Number two, number three. Um, I think my colleague uh, Timothy already mentioned some something that I wanted to talk about here. The Nigerian political system is a, a juggernaut that needs to be dismantled. I'll give you an example. You find somebody like the former governor of Lagos, Fashola. When Fashola came to power, we saw what happened in Nigeria. He took the bull by the horn. He dismantled a lot of racketeering and corruption. And we saw what happened in Nigeria. We saw what happened in Lagos. Lagos were transformed. Now, the same Fashola was made a minister, I think minister of um, a project or something like that. The same Fashola could not perform. Why do you think he could not perform? He was put a hammer on the head by the system. When he was a governor, he had everything. He had control of the, uh, of the budget. He had control. He could supervise the project by himself. He delivered projects. He foresaw that those projects were executed. And it kept the, the, the result were there for everybody to solve. But the same person is given a ministry, and he almost is like he's non-existent. We don't see anything that Fashola has done. That's to tell you that he is dealing with a system that is not letting him do what he wants to do. So is Peter Obi, Atiku, Kwan Kwaso, or anybody that wins, are they ready to dismantle the system in Nigeria that is at the root cause of what the country is going through? Because it's not just the work of president. Like he mentioned, Buhari came there. Everybody was saying, oh, the Buhari of uh, war against indiscipline, the Buhari of 1986, the Buhari of this. Oh, let's give him the chair. Let's give him the presidency. He came there. He did not meet the expectation. Everybody said, Buhari is this. Because Nigeria sometimes do not understand that the way Nigeria runs is a gigantic racketeering system that needs to be dismantled for anybody to function. Because when you have the budget, the budget does not just go from the president to execution of the project. It goes through the House of Assembly. It goes through local government. It goes through the local government area. It goes through a lot of tiering before it gets through to whoever is going to execute the project. And these people are the juggernauts that will not want these things to succeed because they want to feel the unprocured. We heard recently that I can't remember the percentage of Nigerian petrol that is stolen at the level of the tankers that are supposed to collect that petrol who is in charge of this how does this happen the same people in the government are the one racket have got this racketeering network that are collecting this oil oil and gas and put into their pocket is the government or whoever takes the responsibility of the helm state ready to dismantle that political juggernaut that network that is stealing the resources of the country so again the expectations are so enormous on whoever is going to take the presidency now let's talk about security. We have the IPOP in the Eastern Nigerian side. We have in the north those Fulanis and all those jihadis and all those who are not. This is a joke and not of a problem that whoever comes is going to take a different dimension. 
I have told my people in Africa that, yes, you can fight a war. But sometimes you are not going to kill yourself to victory. Sometimes you have to sit on the table with your enemies. This cause peace and reconciliation. We have seen cases where people have sat down, even with Boko Haram, to say, look, guys, this thing you are fighting, lay down your arms. People are dying. When it comes to reconciliation, whoever takes the power needs to take the difficult road to bring down all the sons and daughters of Nigeria on the table and see how they can discuss the affairs of the country. Am I saying here that Nigeria is supposed to split into pieces? No. But what I'm saying is, whatever the aspirations of the people are, the president needs to organize something like a national conference on Nigerians to have sit on the table and discuss the issues that are plaguing the country. Because you can take over power if you still have all these jihadis and I pop in the east, and jihadis are people trying to tear the country apart, and you're spending close to 25% of the budget of the country on security, something that should have been going on the development of the economy, you are not going to achieve your aims. So you, the president, need to take some other drastic measures to see that the security situation in the country, you know, I even forgot uh, Yoruba nation, the Yoruba nation is there itself. They too are, you know, trying to tear the umpire. So the whole thing, the president needs to take a different approach when it comes to the security of Nigeria and make sure that people can sit down and talk on even difficult issues, issues that are like a taboo. Sit down on the negotiating table and discuss and take out the argument of those warring factions and put it on the table and say, your argument does not make sense. Let's talk on this area. Let's talk on this area. And that's how Nigeria is going to develop. Otherwise, as long as you are using 25% of the national budget on security, you cannot develop on such premises. So again, it's an enormous task, but I think it's doable. It's an enormous task, and uh, you believe it's doable. Back to you, uh, Mr. Timothy. What do you think uh, the former president, the outgoing president, failed to do that uh, puts Nigeria where it is? And do you think uh, those who are coming have learned a lesson from that, and can they be uh, do better? Is there a possibility? Uh, switch on your microphone, Mr. Timothy. I, I, I think basically, if you if you look at one of the areas in which people feel that President Muhammad Buhari was so relaxed and. Uh, one will begin to ask the question: It was if he was in control of government. Is the issue of insecurity? I see. Let me let me let me tell you something. You see, if this proactive measures Buhari is putting in place as it is now with the elections, were the same proactive measures he used to have dealt with the issue of insecurity in this country. Honestly speaking, Nigerians might even be clamoring for a third term for President Muhammadu Buhari. You see, like I said to you uh, uh, some some minutes ago, I told you. I said, the moment Buhari is able to deliver these elections in a free and fair manner, he seems to be forgiven. Now, what are his sins? He sins that it is during Buhari's time that we, we lost a lot of Nigerians, a lot of people died by installment, a lot of people lost their lives and properties, a lot of people became homeless. We have so many IDP camps. We, it, it, it's a problem we thought that Buhari would have come to solve that began with President Kulo Jonathan, exacerbated to the point we have it today, whereby it is you find it difficult to travel to the Abuja Karuna Expressway. You find it difficult to even travel to people find it difficult to be, to travel by road as it is in this country. Now, number two, if Buhari had let's look at the issue of road networks in this country. The road networks in this country are still very, very terrible. They are terrible in the sense that it seems to me that President Muhammad Buhari did not give much interest on infrastructure in, in Nigeria most especially as, as it has to do with roads. If you, you, if you go through Kaduna, and Abu, this, this is a road I take almost every, every week. If you pass through that road, you begin to ask very fundamental question. Why is the Kaduna Abuja road the way it is? If you travel from, Loko, from Abuja to Lokota, you'll find the same problems. You will know that the roads are highly, uh, are, are not in good condition. If you travel from Lokota to Edo State, it, it is even the worst. Now, the issue of insecurity, too, is on the increase at that level. If you travel from Auchi to Benin or through Auchi, Benin, Ekoma, or you go through Igara platform, you will see that 
the roads are terrible. This is also one area that Buhari did not even make an effort. Let's go back to the issue of education. The issue of education, which is very, very key to any, to any democratic consolidation. You cannot separate education from the evolving of democracy. It is under Buhari's government that ASU went on strike for months without governments, without Buhari's government showing any interest to call back ASU. It is during Buhari's time in this country that uh, issues of uh, economy, the, the economy dwindled. A bag of rice were buying for 3,500, skyrocketed to about 36, 36 to 40,000 Naira in this country. It is during Buhari's government that, as, it, as I speak to you, the fuel crisis is still looming on. You cannot conveniently enter a filling station without hazards. Why? Because the queues are in the increase. In fact, as, it, as I speak to you just yesterday in Kaduna, when a particular tanker driver brought fuel to one of the filling stations, in, 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 it was just a matter of minutes before you could see the queue. And in, a, in, in such a situation, I even thought I could even queue. But when I saw the length of queue, I had to give up. I had to give up. And I just went back home. Why? Because I couldn't have seen myself waiting for such kind of a queue. So the whole, the, the whole, the, in fact, everything about Buhari's government is just in the best. I, I can, I, I can hardly tell you that this is what Buhari has done in this country. That I will clap for. You. Is it the issue of dollar? The increase, the, the way, the way, the way the, the dollar has become, you know, something else, whereby you can hardly even have a good exchange of dollar. So there, there are so many issues to to, 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 to speak about about this government. Or is it, is, is it the respect for human life, which is very, which is, which is core? So, and that is why I still want to let you know that the only, the only way we can forgive President Muhammadu Burahi his sins, the only way Nigerians can absorb him for what he has done in this country is when the president is able to deliver a free and fair elections. Okay. It's not all about delivering the candidates. Because whether Obi wins, whether Kongwaso wins or Atiku, that is inconsequential at this point. But the question is, is the election free and fair? That is where, for me, is fundamental. So if the elections are free and fair, all the sins of President Muhammadu Buhari that he has done in the past, either by either, either intentionally or by uh, due to him being complacent, or whatever mm -hmm. the case is, like I said, these are a lot of variables that there are a lot of variables that have made us to have that kind of a mindset that at all levels, Buhari's government did not make any impact in the lives of Nigerians. Thank you very much. Mr. Tulu, now, many believe that uh, ruling a country requires a lot of experience. And when you look at the list of those uh, going in, many have been clamoring for pizza or B, but then, uh, he's not as experienced as the others who are in the race. Uh, someone like Tinubu, who believes he's a kingmaker, and uh, Atiku, who is being the vice president. Uh, do you think experience is what Nigerians need? And or do you think being youthful like Peter Obi is what Nigeria needs at this time? So, uh, I would like to correct the, the notion that Peter Obi is not experienced. Peter Obi is was the governor of Anambra State for eight years. Hmm. So Tinubu was the governor of Lagos State for eight years as well. Kwakwaso was governor of Kano State, 1999-2003, 2011-2015. So all of them have been ex governor All of them have been governors in the past for eight years, apart from Atiku Abaka, who was vice president. So I wouldn't say Peter Obi is the inexperienced one amongst the pack. Yes, he is the only one that has never held any project any ministerial position or at the federal <laughs> level because Atiku was vice president, you know, Kwa Kwansu was a minister. Ashiwa Jibola Tinumbu has never held, okay, was a senator in the 90s. So in terms of experience, I strongly disagree that Peter Obi is the inexperienced one among them. Mm -hmm. But in terms of youth, youthfulness as well, he's not, Peter Obi is not a youth, by the way. He's about 61 years of age. And I don't think there's any parameter where such, such a man is a, is, is a youth, but I think he's the youngest amongst them all because yeah. he's 61. Yeah. Atiku Abaka is in his mid 70s, Ashiwaji is around 70, Rapi Kwakwansu is in his mid 60s. So I don't believe that uh, Peter Obi is inexperienced, but even when we talk about is he experienced or youth that should take over, I think it's a mixture of both. You need a man who is active, who is agile, who is ready to take on the task because. 
as president, you will be acting for a, a, lot, a significant portion of the day. Like I heard Bob, when Barack Obama was president of US, he used to work for 18, 20 hours a day at times. So you can't slack in that area. And even, even before we even get to the pres president, the MD of a major multinational would be working for several hours a day. So you need that agile, you need that youthful energy, if I must put it that way. And of course, you need the experience to maneuver through the system. And one of the attacks against, you know, Peter B, for instance, is that he does not have a structure. Even if he wins, the National Assembly will frustrate him. Yet, yes, that is true. We have the, you know, in a presidential system of government, the legislature are there to pass the rules, the budget, and yeah, they will probably put roadblocks on the way if they were to emerge. But he has faced this kind of challenge before, even as governor of Anambra State at the time. He, when he became governor, eventually, he had no member of his party in the House of Assembly, but he was able to overcome this. So, in my opinion, both experience, both that mental agility is needed to rule. And the challenges are enormous. It's a systemic problem, like uh, the others, I think, Dr. Enoch, who said earlier, the system would frustrate you. We've seen it with Ashu, with you know Raji Fashola, who did well as governor of Lagos State, and as a minister, he could not really do well in the power sector before that ministry was taken off from him. So Nigeria's problem is quite dicey. And if you ask me, you need both the youthful youthful power and the experience to rule. And amongst all three of them. If Ashiwaji were to win, for instance, because APC is currently the ruling party, so the legislature will be aligned with him. But the legislature has been aligned with President Buhari in the last four years, and we did not see the result of this. So I wouldn't... It's, it's a dicey situation for anyone who is taking over, and we can only hope for the best. We can only hope for the best. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tulu. Now, back to you, uh, Mr. Elijah. All through the process, 18 candidates running for the presidential race, but we didn't see any form of a coalition showing up. What does this mean? Or well, look at a list of 18, <clears throat> and there's no, there's, there's not been any coalition to, you know, up to right to the end. Well, actually, uh, the contrary. You know, uh, Obi was not originally a Labour Party. Obi, <laughs> Obi only decamped when he couldn't get the. Uh, uh, the flag, become the flag bearer of the other party. I think PDP, mm. if I remember, mm. uh, that's when he decamped to the Labour Party. So there, there has been some sort of a coalition. But you would think this election in Nigeria seems to be a little bit peculiar in a way, because this is one of the first time where you find a third party really becoming a contender. Most of the time it's either PDP and APC, or before then, before APC became APC, it was either the ruling party and the major opposition party, the other ones were just filling the forms and being, you know, known as presidential candidates and not actually contenders. But this time we actually have a possibility that a third party, neither the main opposition party or the, uh, the party in power, might actually win. So this is actually one of the first in Nigeria that we've seen in the, in the recent uh, current memory. But on the other end, I would think that uh, Nigerians, um, the expectation, I keep going on to this issue of expectation. My colleagues, the other colleagues, I will uh, uh, salute their point, but I want to point out something, that when it comes to inflation, people heap the blame on the president. But when it comes to inflationary tendencies, there is very little that a president, even Buhari, would have done. Because if you look at the war in Ukraine, that put inflationary dollar or petrol dollars or whatever it is on the world economy. It is not just Nigeria. All over the world, even here in the Western world, people are crying. Everything has, the price of everything has gone up. So on that aspect, I don't think we can blame Buhari on that aspect. But there are other issues that we can blame him for. Because if the issue is over-promising and under-performing, under, under, uh, Again, I said expectations, especially on, you know, let me call him out, on Peter Obi, for example. He's been telling everybody that he wants to take Nigeria from consumption to production. 
good mm -hmm. propaganda, good uh, platform. It's doable. But again, it took years for Nigeria to be where they are today. And it's going to take years to get to Nigeria to where he's promising. And within the first four years, Nigerians are going to be evaluating him and said, you promised to move us from <laughs> consumption to production. We are not seeing it. I am afraid that whoever takes over, even it's Peter Ovi, what happened to Buhari might happen to him. Let's remember, within the Nigerian political sphere right now, there are people that say, oh, when Yaradua was coming to power, they said, uh, I mean, uh, Jonathan, they said, oh, we miss Yaradua. Yeah. When Jonathan left power, they said, we miss Jonathan. When, uh, 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 I'm afraid that when Buhari shall leave, and whoever takes over, the same syndrome is going to happen. They're going to start missing Buhari because, again, is the issue of expectation. People are over-expecting. And whoever wins power carries that expectation with him. And if you do not deliver, the same thing is going to start happening. But again, I'm saying, if the powers that be, like what my colleague mentioned, that the system might frustrate if, for example, I'm just giving for an example, I'm not saying that Peter Obi is going to win, he might win, but if, for example, Peter Obi wins, and somebody says the system is frustrating, yes, there are other ways around it. He can rule by executive power. The Constitution gives him the right to bypass certain constitutional uh, bodies and go to the people and say, I have come up with a budget, this is what I want to do, but here is the bottleneck. The people that you people voted there, I've decided to put, become a hindrance to the nation, and I think this is what we need to do. That is where he can overcome some of these and put himself out there to the people. Because again, the president is supposed to be the one that aspires people to go beyond the ideal. To be, I mean, to be the ideal. The president is the person that aspires. It is not just the one who comes there and says, I want to do this, I want to do that. You should aspire to people to say, this is possible. That's what Obama did in the United States. That's what Trudeau is doing in Canada. That's what all the people, all over, uh, president all over the world are doing. You aspire people to say, we can do better. I can be better. I know that my future can, it's not where I am. And then people bring out their best, the best of themselves, and they want to perform. In education, in Nigeria, for example, it doesn't matter what sector you want to point to. You can use every metric in the world. You're going to say that Buhari has failed. But the person before Buhari, it was the same thing. I am afraid if you're going to use the same metrics for the person after Buhari, you might come to the same conclusion after four or eight years. So what I'm saying is Nigeria should understand that this is going to take time. It's not going to happen in four years. I'm afraid even eight years, it's not going to happen. They should take it at a stride that it is going to take a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of sacrifices on the part of the population as well. Because as I said, if Buhari, I mean, uh, sorry, if whoever wants to go through, wants to take the measures that are put on the table by the IMF or even the uh, Nigeria Central Bank, it will mean pain on the population. Just take the example of fuel subsidy. If you take that away, it's going to mean pain on the people. But what, that's what the people are asking for. That you should cut all these bring the, pump that money into the economy, into, a, into roads. My colleague Timothy mentioned uh, road infrastructure, for example. They say in economics that where a road passes, development follows. But for some reason, African president seems not to have gotten this. It's not just the issue of worry. All over Africa, they don't understand the importance of good infrastructure, what is going to pump into economy, and what is going to do to the average life of every person who lives in that economy. So whoever becomes the president, if you, you know, streamline your platform and say, I'm going to focus on number one, road infrastructure, for example, that you mentioned, you succeed in that one alone. I'm telling you, you're going to change the economy of Nigeria. But if you start going through, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, you, do, you give a platform of 20 or 30 metrics that you're going to do, and people start measuring you on those metrics, at the end of the day, they're going to say, I wish Buhari was there than this man that is here today. Because that's what's happening in Nigeria all the time. They always miss the one that has just left, 
until the one that gets in. Oh, this is the one that gets in. Then when things start getting bad, then they'll say, oh, I wish it was Yaradua. I wish it was Jonathan. I wish it was this. I hope it's not the case like this. I hope Nigerians will elect somebody who will focus on the needy greedy of what Nigeria needs. Road infrastructure, security, and education. You tackle these three, people will see the effect right away. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Elijah Inwoku. We got your point very clearly. And uh, just remind us of you who are watching that if you want to be part of the program, you can get to us via the numbers which will be put up on your screen. You can call us directly via WhatsApp and share with us your opinion. Who will win and uh, what is your opinion regarding the elections in Nigeria? We we'll highly welcome your opinions. Now, uh, Mr. Timothy, another aspect is if we have to consider the religious and ethnic uh, situation in Nigeria, and equally trying to place a balance on these, what do you think will be the outcome of whoever wins? Will the result or the outcome of the result or the elections be welcome? And do you think and do you believe that it could be welcome? Or will it cause uh, some kind of uprising or a kind of dissatisfaction? But we have to look at the uh, religious and ethnic balance, which has to be respected to you know, uh, make sure that everyone is satisfied. Your microphone is off, Mr. Timothy. Yeah, there, there are a lot of dynamics to this. And, and your question your question is really multifaceted. I, I want you to help me, because I want to get you right. I, I want you to just, give, just streamline the first, first badge of it first. Sorry, the first badge of it, then I can now know how to enter the second badge. Yeah, the electoral process or the... the, the, the uh, Power process in Nigeria has always been on the balance of ethnic and religion. Uh, religion. Now, considering these two and looking at the candidates who are vying for the top job, do you think that their different religious and ethnic positions can, you know, help place that balance without causing any form of disgruntlement or dissatisfaction in the two camps? Yeah, I, I do not. I, I do not think. Um, uh, I, I, like I said, it, it, it's highly complicated because for, because of the candidates involved. First and foremost, you should know that uh, Peter Obi picked a northern candidate, mm. and at the same time, you know that uh, Tinubu, the issue of the Muslim, the Muslim ticket is also an issue. Then, if you look at um, uh, uh, Atiku Abuakar, um, uh, of course, uh, they, 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 he picked from the south south. And if you look at Kwan Kwaso as, it, as the case, maybe also from the South South. Now, it's what we're going to be having here is, is it's going to go beyond religion and ethnicity. I, I must I must let you know this because um, from my from my uh, uh, I, 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 what I what I was under study and research, it it, it it looks as if at this point in time people are more interested in picking the right candidates for the job. And of course, you cannot you cannot completely rule out the issue of ethnicity or religion. But I can guarantee you that uh, the level of uh, competence, the level of uh, um, uh, 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 proactiveness, as the case may be, from the candidate is what people are going after. Because let me tell you the truth: whether you are a Christian, whether you are a Muslim, whether you are Igbo, whether you are Hausa. The point is, Nigerians are tired. I must tell you the truth. Nigerians are tired. Now, let, me, let me play statistics to you. I, I come from a, I, I come from Kaduna South, and uh, as the case may be, uh, I mean, sorry, I voted in Kaduna South, and but if you look at Kaduna as a whole, you should also remember that the the, 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 the vice president candidate is from Kaduna, and of course, it's from Northern Kaduna. And whether you like it or not, there's going to be a spirit of vote over there for. For, for 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 the candidates from that ethnic or, or from that ethnic group, but be that as it may, in as much as you cannot completely undermine the role of religion and ethnicity, but I also want to guarantee you that the, the stronghold in this election goes beyond um, uh, ethnicity, ethnicity and religion, because uh, the tiredness of Nigeria in the current situation is what is propelling Nigerians to go and vote. When you ask those on the on the on the on, if you ask those who are just queuing to go and vote, they tell you, bros, we are tired. It's all about we are tired. It's no longer about whether I am Muslim or whether I am Christian, whether I am Igbo, whether I am Hausa, 
or whether I'm from Edo or whether I'm an African traditional worshiper. The point is, we are what? Tired. We are tired of the status quo. It, because people, people, can, people have now realized that, look, it, 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 it's no longer the game of ethnicity. It's no longer the game of religion. Because uh, when, you, when you look at, when you look at uh, people like Konkwaso, you will understand that if you put Konkwaso side by side, Atiku and uh, 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 the, the vice president of, of uh, the, I'm sorry, the vice presidential candidate uh, of uh, Bola Tinubu, whether you like it or not, Konkwasia is a movement. Konkwasia is a movement in the north. Konkwasia is a big movement. And if not for the fact that uh, uh, this whole game of uh, 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 power rotation and stuff like that, that is into play, I could, I will assure you that Kwan Kwaso uh, would have would have not been taken for granted in this uh, 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 in this in this election, but the way it is going, and from the feeder I'm getting from the feeder I'm getting as it is, uh, it's 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 more more it, it's beyond religion, is beyond politics. But at the same time, you cannot completely do away with religion and ethnicity in this game. But as it is, as it is now, it is moving and tilting towards beyond ethnicity. I just want you to be very careful with my words. I'm not saying religion or ethnicity is not, is not at play. It is at play. But the way it is going now, it, and, and of course, you should understand that, look, my brother, it is not all those who come out during campaign. <laughs> very, very well. Nigerians are just looking for way of, you know, Maybe people who have no job will just go out and go and join and want to campaign, want to campaign. On the day of the election, people go to vote who they want to vote for. That will also shock you. That you might even meet somebody who is not, uh, you might even meet somebody from the north voting Peter Obi. Not like, like what I saw uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at the polling station. Uh, people will tell you, it's Peter Obi, it's Peter Obi. But again, somebody might even be telling you that it's Peter Obi and will vote another person. So these dynamics are, are at play. But what is predominantly in this situation now is that people are beginning to think and tilt towards ethnicity and, and, and religion, trying to see how they can boycott it from this electoral process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, picking the right candidate for the job. And uh, shall we? consider the fact that ethnicity and religion, which is what many are expecting that there should be a balance with this. Mr. Tulu, do you think that the outcome of this result will be welcome? You know, many are uh, you know, excited by the fact that the electoral process has been unfolding uh, calmly, but the issue now is the outcome of the result. Do you think it will be welcome if we have to take into consideration religion and ethnicity? Equally considering the fact that we're looking at the right person for the right uh, for the job, but not leaving out ethnicity and religion. Do you think these uh, candidates who are you know running for the top job, do you think if they win, would their you know their win would be welcome without any uh, you know without any contestor and without anyone be, you know showing dissatisfaction? Uh, yes, and the short answer to your question, no, I don't, I don't, I don't see general acceptance. The last time there was general acceptance of any result was 2015, and that's why because President Goodluck Jonathan considered the election before the results were announced and called uh, President General Muhammad Ubuari at the time. In 2019, Alaji Abaka went to, Atiku Abaka, the presidential aspirant of PDP, went to court, so... Even 2011, if we, if we go, go back to 2011 election, that was 12 years ago, when Gulag Jonathan was announced as president, there was violence in, the, in some parts of northern Nigeria because President Muhammadu Buhari did not win at the time. So uh, I think we'll go back to that era of contest and clashes about the result of the election. I don't see that acceptance. See, for instance, uh, Peter Obi were to win, there would be clamor by the other parties that it wasn't a free and fair election. In fact, this morning, when Ashiwa Jibola met Inumbu voted in Lagos, a question was posed to him that would he congratulate 
the winner, if it, if it turns out that it does not emerge as the winner, if another person emerges as the winner. And Tinubu's response was like, I will win. The winner has to be me. So you can see people with that mindset. Is that the kind of person that would accept if Atiku were to win or if Obi were to win? Or uh, looking at Atiku Abaka as well, he has been contested in 1993. Some of us were not born at the time. He has he contested in 1993, 99. At some point, he stepped down, then became governor. Then 2007, he contested. 2011, he lost in primaries. 2015, he lost in primaries. He's not going to accept any result that comes. So I can already see a situation where there would be a tribunal case, no matter who emerges as the winner. Like, it's almost, it's, 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 I don't want to say it's 100% certain, but it, it, it appears to be that way because all the major parties really want to win and they are desperate to have that, that title as president. Like, it's for them right now, it's, while I won't say it's a do or die affair, like, they are putting their all into it. And I don't, I don't see general acceptance of the result. If Ashiwaju were to win, he, our brothers in the Southeast and South South and even the youth on social media would be, dev a lot of them would be devastated by the result because they are followers of Peter Obi. If Obi were to win, some people in Southwest and, you know, the ruling party would be, would be angry at the result. And uh, like Dr. Aditi pointed out, he, uh, about the Muslim Muslim ticket of Ashiwaju and, you know, Shetima, the Christian, some parts of the Christian community would not be happy we have a Muslim Muslim president. Considering the, you know, the attacks on churches around Nigeria in the last few years, there was the massacre in the war in the in northern Nigeria. There have been attacks on churches. So I don't I don't see a general acceptance of the result as the case may be. That's my opinion. Thank you, Tunu. We got that clearly. Uh, now, let's hear from you, Mr. Elijah. Uh, what has mattered has been the religious and ethnic balance at the top of every party's ticket. What do you think will be the outcome if uh, any of the candidates win? What do you think will look like regarding the insecurity situation and uh, the attack on Muslims, attack on Christians, and the insecurity situation in the country? How do you analyze what the outcome will look like? Uh, I, I, I think uh, it's an unfortunate situation that we have to be talking about election based on religion or ethnicity or let the best candidates win. Whoever represents the aspirations of Nigerians and, and his elected president of Nigeria should win. In fact, there's been this unwritten law in the Nigerian constitution that after a time when the northerner rolls, then the next election should be the southerner, then the next should be the northern. It's not written in the constitution, but it seems to be an unwritten law that people seem to have it in their subconscious mind. But that is some of the things that should not, you know, that is not democracy. Democracy is the ruling by the wishes and the aspirations of the people. Okay. Now, when it comes to ethnic clashes, you know, we have uh, IPOB in the east. We have, you know, Boko Haram in the north. As I mentioned, there's Yoruba nations and a lot of other ramblings here and there. But what Nigerians should understand, what people should understand is, what makes you a Nigerian? It's not where you come from. It's true that you have regional representation in the House of Assembly. You have elected representative, federal representative in the House of Assembly. That's, what, that's how you channel your, your local aspiration. But when it comes to state affairs, it shouldn't be based on regional considerations or whatever it is. It should be based on who is best situated to handle the country and handle the job. That's what people should look at. It's true that, you know, we've seen some rumblings about you know, uh, people in the north or people in the south or people in the Yoruba area and so on and so forth. But again, there are still going to be people that will contest election. Like my colleague said, uh, Tulu said, uh, almost every election has been contested, but that sometimes that's part of democracy. You know, if somebody feels that he or she is cheated and he has the proof, you, know, you can go to the court and try to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to disprove the results. But as long as you don't have credible evidence that the results disfavor you. Uh, the, whoever wins is still going to stand. But my call is for all Nigerians to a accept the result of the ballot box. Whether it's Atiku, it's Obi, Kwankaso, or uh, Tinubu, whoever wins, let people accept the result and let them be peace. Because at the end of the day, 
I do not think if OB win, OB is going to channel the national budget of the country to Igbo people. Or if Tinubu wins, Tinubu is going to channel the national resources of the country to Yoruba people. Or Atiku wins, he's going to channel the national resources of the people to Northerners. No, that's not what a presidency is supposed to be. Presidency is to every person, whether you voted for the one that finally become the president or not, he is your president and he is supposed to channel the aspiration of your country. So again, this mine is just a call for peace and calm in the nation, no matter who wins. Let there be peace. Because again, if you look at African countries, this is not particularly Nigeria, go through the budget allocation of African countries and see what percentage of the budget is allocated to peace and security. Money that should have been used to develop the economy, road network, as my colleague mentioned, education, food, electricity. In Nigeria, as we speak today, there are people that go for weeks, they can't charge their phones because there's no electricity. But how much money is allocated for security? Huge billions of dollars every year. That money would have been used for all those things. So again, let people take this into mind that at the end of the day, they were shooting themselves on the foot if there is any insecurity or anything that results from that election because what you are aspiring for, if there is no peace, the money is going to, the government is going to take that money, pump that money into security apparatus, and at the end of the day, you will remain at the same position and your condition will not change. But if there is peace, that money that would have been used to maintain, go for security and so on, it will be pumped into economy. At the end of the day, you are going to you know, uh, benefit the economic of it. So I just want to call for peace, whoever wins the elections. Peace uh, for whoever wins the election, it's utmost important. Mr. Tiboti, uh, the issue here is that the population on ground might not be satisfied with their candidates not winning. Do you see uh, a message being sent across to these people on the ground, those who, of course, are always agitating and uh, wanting their candidates to win? Uh, uh, the security on the ground, do you think it's enough to, you know, the calm, to calm a situation like to calm any uh, situation that might arise as a result of maybe uh, those on the ground being disgruntled that their candidate has not won? Yeah, you have to put on your microphone, Mr. Timothy, because we realize that the issue is not the candidate themselves, but their supporters. Yeah, you see, um, I want to differ from my distinguished senior colleague and researcher when he said that uh, whoever wins wins. Uh, you know, you see, yeah, whoever wins wins, but the question is whoever wins, the, the, the person wins out of the free and fair election? If, you see, there is nothing wrong to contest. A, 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 a result. There's nothing wrong. But you see, if, if, if I'm, I, as a lecturer, if a student fails, and a student feels that he is not comfortable or not satisfied with the fact that he failed, or not satisfied with the result, the student have the right to contest it. It's a fundamental human right. He has the right to contest. And uh, possibly because of certain variables he must have seen, or certain situations or whatever, whatever, maybe, maybe thinking of error of something like that. So if the Nigerian people feel that the results are not free and fair, they have the right to contest it. Or else if we keep having this whole idea of whoever wins wins, without necessarily looking at the fact that the results were not free and fair, then it's going to be business as usual. Then the question that will be, well, where will that be the whole idea about democracy? Where does democracy now come in? So it is natural for people to contest. Most especially if they discover that the elections are not free and fair. But the question now is, in what manner and how do they contest the, the, the results? Now, do they go through the courts? Or do they go by protest, by destroying, killing, uh, and, 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 and making people homeless just because they want to contest a result? No. There's a, there's a process. There is there, there are, there are judici judicial process that have been put in place to contest an election, and so therefore, it is natural. And like one of my, like like uh, the other Paul who said, it is natural to contest it. it uh, for me, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, people should contest when they know that it's not free and fair. 
So, but you, you see, the, the point remains, and what is that point? The, the point is that a candidate must definitely emerge. And, uh, and um, at the same time, candidates and, uh, should be able, because everything boils down to the candidate. If the candidate accepts, look, this election is free and fair, and I think whoever must have emerged as winner should be given the rightful position. Just like uh, Good Luck Jonathan extended his congratulation, congratulatory call to President Muhammadu Buhari saying, you have won, Mr. President. He even called him Mr. President. So it, it, it begins from, it begins from the, 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 the candidates themselves. Because if you look at what is happening in Lagos, you will, like somebody observed, like one of the, one of the uh, speakers observed, if you look at what is happening in Lagos, now it shows that there's a tendency that candidates will not accept the result. Because in, in a situation where you begin to see intimidation, ballot snatching from certain areas, it, it gives a signal that certain candidates if the result comes out, we have to, we will we'll not take it lightly. And why, why is it so? Because of the desperation, the desperation to hold on to power. And, but again, you see, we have to begin to learn how to resign to faith. And, and this is where I want to meet with my distinguished senior researcher. This is where we want to meet. There are certain times we just need to take certain things in good faith. You know, that, even if it is very, very clear that the elections were not free and fair, but for the sake of the common good, for the sake of the peace of the state, just allow certain things to do. But if you feel that it is not right, and it, is, it is not a free and fair election, then go through the judicial process. Go to court. Let the courts decide. It is not, it is, at this point now, it is not the, it's no longer the people who will decide. It is the court who, due to available facts, beyond reasonable doubt, who will now come and say, the election in this particular area, or the ele election is now null and void because of certain irregularities. So we have a, we already have a judicial process for that. But again, people should develop a spirit of sportsmanship. And I think that is where my distinguished uh, senior researcher is coming from. People should begin to inculcate and begin to have the spirit of sportsmanship. And I think this is where the whole idea about the peace committee, that they, they peace, they commit, they, sorry, the peace agreement committee that, you know, had, that met yesterday, this, this is the area they, they, they came in. By assuring that uh, I mean candidates to assure that they should whoever emerge as the winner of the of the election, please there's no cause to to instigate, there's no cause to 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 trigger, and there's no cause to feel that uh, you are not wanted. But it's just that one candidate must get, definitely emerge, and so therefore, let us sign an agreement that there will be peace. So I, I, I think going forward, going forward, people should develop that spirit of sportsmanship. People should develop that uh, spirit of acceptance, and people should develop that spirit of uh, uh, having having the fact that uh, everybody must not win. It's just that one person must win, and I think that would be the way forward for us to have a deep, decent democratic process. Thank you very much. We got your opinion clearly. Now, just to add to what you said, uh, President Buhari on Thursday tweeted that there should be no riots or acts of violence after the announcement of the election results. And he further stated that all grievances, personal or institutional, should be channeled to uh, the relevant courts. Mr. Elijah, do you think that uh, grievances, riots will be avoided? Is there a possibility to avoid that when the results would have been announced. Uh, let me just uh, mention something here from my colleague here, Mr. Adidi. Um, yeah, we are on the same point. I wasn't saying that people should not challenge elections. No. In every election, in a democratic process, if you feel cheated, you should follow the right channel. What I'm talking about here is that people should not take the laws into their own hands because that's where the chaos result from. When people take the laws into their own hands, you know, Anger start rising, burning start rising, street rioting start rising. Then people are going, people like jihadists will take advantage of that, enter in there, killings will happen, and the government will be bound to react. When the government is bound to react, what does the government do? The government is going to slash the budget that would have been used for food for people to eat. The government is going to slash the budget that would have been used for the economy. The government is going to slash the budget that would have been used for electricity. 
the government is going to slide the budget for. In fact, everybody will be affected when people do not follow the right channel to, you know, ask for their right to be respected. So that's what we are going. That's what we are going at. We are not saying that people should not challenge the return. No. If you find results, I mean, uh, credible evidence that mm -hmm. they were cheating, you follow the right channel to submit that, and then the courts will look into it. And in fact. I really salute the courts in Nigeria because there have been cases where we've seen free, you know, courts being given the free hand to exercise their rights. It's not, it's not like some countries in Africa where you see the courts themselves being controlled by the state. You only have to give the judgment that comes from the state. And again, the president of Nigeria, you know, in as much as people lampoon Buhari and do whatever they want to do, I'm not a fan of him myself, but let's give him some credit. He has set the tone for a peaceful election. He has, you know, come out clearly to even the, the monetary policy that we saw clearly. Buhari came out and said he did not want people to use money to intimidate people to exercise their rights. That is somebody that we see that he wants free and fair elections. All the candidates to come out with some sort of a communique to tell their members and say, whatever be the result, if we are cheated, we are going to follow the rightful channel to contest. Tell their candidates not to go burning. Tell their candidates not to go to the street killing. Tell their candidates not to go out and carry out rioting and all whatnot that's going to result in death, human death. When that is done, of course, the right channel is going to be used to channel the attention, <coughs> and people are going to accept the result or whatever come out. Again, like my colleague said, one candidate at the end of the day has to uh, uh, become the victor. And everybody cannot become president. We can't have Tiku Abubakar uh, and Obi and Kwan Koso and all of them become president. No, it's one person that's going to finally emerge president. But again, if you feel cheated, follow the rightful channel in order for the legitimate process to be taken so that you know the rightful candidate is de declared. Now, let me come to the other point that you mentioned. If I remember, you asked me, will the people accept? It is very normal that people are not going to accept the election. Nobody <laughs> accepts being a failure. But at the end of the day, people need to take into consideration the cost, the cost of trying to take the other route to the population. And again, Nigeria represents the aspiration, as I said before, Nigeria represents the aspiration of the black world. What happens in Nigeria is going to spill across. To, it's going to spill to uh, the neighboring countries all around. It's going to spill to all the other sectors of the economy. It's going to hamper the development of whoever is. Could be Obi, it could be Kwankasoi, it could be Atiku. If there is violence, if there's violence, it's going to hamper the platform of whoever emerges as a victor. We have to give credit to good luck, Jonathan, because this man came out clearly way ahead of his of, of his uh, uh, of his uh, uh, the party to accept the resolved election. And if there is anything that happens in this election, we are expecting all of them to come out, not just to say I congratulate this person, but come their members and say yes, we feel we are cheated, but please calm down. We are going to follow the legal channel to contest this election. As long as you do not come out to say that, people are going to take the laws into their own hands. Like, uh, you know, my friend uh, Tulu already said, you see what's happening in Lagos. Hoodlums going all over the place. If the members of APC or the flag bearer of APC have come out and say, please, nobody should intimidate or do any of that or those things, I don't think this would have been happening. So the responsibility lies on the candidate themselves, whatever the result is on how that it is being conducted and whatever channel they take in order to contest the election. So responsibility lies on those candidates. They should come out and do something about it. And they'll repeat. That's what I think. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Elijah. We got you. We still have some few uh, minutes to get your reaction. Those of you who want to call us to share with us your thoughts. Tell us who you think will win and why and your opinion regarding of the overall electoral process in Nigeria is equally highly welcome. Mr. Tulu, the issue now is sending across a message to every Nigerian to respect the outcome of the election, no matter whoever 
wins. What do you have to tell, especially the young people out there we know constitutes the majority of the population out there, those who went to vote, those who always go to the streets are mostly young people. When it comes to riot, they are always the young people. Now, what is the message to the young people out there in Nigeria regarding uh, the expectation of the outcome of the results? Mr. Tulu? Okay, sorry. I didn't know the question was directed yeah. to me. So for uh, for us, for a long year of young voters, we have the Generation Z. This is probably their first time of voting. And I would say the event in the last few years has even, you know, influenced and pushed young people to even be more eager to vote in this election. You know, in the last few years, there was an economic downturn, the level, the insecurity, and even the NSAS protests yeah. that happened in 2020 where, you know, uh, the young ones were being intimidated by SAS officials across the country and there was widespread protest. And afterwards, it, it, it brought about some sort of political awareness in my observation, especially on social media. The argument, among, the mantra of submission is go and get your PVC. You have the right to vote, to elect the leaders of your choice. So for a lot of young people, and Nigeria with a young population, this is probably the first time they are voting. I mean, I have a lot of people in my circle who are in their early 20s, mid 20s, and this is the first time they are voting. So for them, uh, not winning the election would be taken in bad faith, although these are not people that are usually prone to violence or that would do any of such, but uh, they would not be happy if probably their private candidate does not win, but it's part of the electoral process. You can't always get what you want. Your candidate will not win every time. No matter who wins, you just have to hope and pray that the person leads the country are right and you have another opportunity to, you know, reassess the situation in the next four years. And unfortunately, unlike some countries where you can easily recall your representatives, maybe in the House of Assembly, or uh, if they are not doing pretty well, Nigerian constitution makes it a bit difficult because to recall an House of Representative member, for instance, you I think from what I read, you need about is it more than a simple majority of uh, voters in that particular constituency. And that's even in a place with a turnout of, say, 60, 50% in an election, to get that number of people to recall someone is pretty hard. And that's where I think our electoral system is not yet sophisticated enough, you know. Mm. In some countries of the world, developed countries, the rep, the rep would be afraid that, oh, these guys can recall me at any point. I don't think any recall process in Nigeria has been successful. Someone can correct me and fact check if I'm wrong. So, I think that's where we need to get to. But uh, my admonition to young voters like myself would be that these are our country. No matter who wins, we need to, you know, accept the result. Of course, after following every legal means of, you know, dispute res resolution, we need to accept what comes and hope that we can always have the opportunity to make better choices in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we got that clearly. Uh, Mr. Timothy, are you there? We are looking at those who are highly concerned in situations like this. The vote casting yeah. has certainly closed in, uh, according to the electoral calendar. Now, the issue now is the vote counting is ongoing and all eyes are now focused on what the outcome will look like now. Uh, what do you think and what are you, do you have to tell the young people out there regarding if their candidate doesn't win? Yeah, I want to make something clear. Uh, the INET chairman said that the vote begins at 8.30 and finishes at 2.30. But in situations where due to either late, uh, people, I mean, I mean, uh, the, the, the process begins very late, if it can extend to Monday, I think the, the, the people are free to still vote on Monday. So it, the, the, the election does not just stop by 2, officially it stops by 2.30, okay. but at given circumstances, it can extend till Monday. So I just want, to, want us to have that very, very clear. Okay. Now, yeah, you see, <laughs> the point is this. It's very, very simple. Uh, uh, somebody must emerge as a winner. Mm -hmm. Somebody must definitely emerge as a winner. And uh, I, 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 I do not want to say that um, uh, 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 Peter Obi will win the election. Uh, but I, I, you can be rest assured that uh, there, are, there, there are going to be grievances. But be that as it may, <clears throat> uh, Nigerians should know that election is not the only way to 
either bring in a leader or to remove a leader. Okay. We have to, and like, like my brother Tolu said, you see, that is where we are not yet educated. That is not the, that is where we have not got into the level of democratic education. And let's let, so, you see, the people have the right to impeach a president. Uh, and like you said, it's just that uh, the, the whole uh, the whole idea about power of recall, impeachment, and of course the fact that the kind of democracy we practice is, is still more or less a, 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 an indirect democracy, which is far from which, which is far from the ideas of the liberal democracy. If not, uh, uh, in, in, a, in, in a climate where democracy is at its peak, uh, it is very it is proper that. Presidents should be afraid of impeachment, and this is this is this has happened in South Africa, where a president has been impeached. So the, the point is, whoever emerges as the as the candidate, and people seem not to be satisfied, they should also know that there's also room for impeachment. And the only way we can impeach a president when you are not satisfied is when you put pressure on the House of Representatives to ensure that that a, a president be impeached. So let us not think that just voting a candidate and the candidate emerges as president, that is the end. No, there are other ways in which we can, you know, impeach a president if we are not comfortable with the, 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 the leadership of that candidate. But again, that, that kind of situation uh, is going to be very, very difficult in Nigeria because of the nature of our politics here. And because I, I, will, I, will, I will guarantee you that uh, by the time Peter Obi, let's say, for example, Peter Obi wins this election, a lot of politicians will decamp to the Labour Party. That is, very, that is a common thing in Nigeria. A lot of people will now begin to decamp to the winning party. They begin to decamp. And at that point, again, you will be able to see another challenge in, 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 in a democratic process. But young people should always know that uh, uh, all hope is not lost. And, and in whichever way it comes out, they have done their best. And uh, uh, I, I will not say their best has not been good enough, but rather to let them know that there's still going to be another opportunity. But uh, at the same time, let us put our ears down. Let us, if there are cases where people feel that the election is not free and fair, they should please bring out their credible, like my colleague used the word, credible evidence to, to bring before uh, the, 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 the right process so that we can begin to address it the way it is. At the long run, whoever becomes the president, Nigerians, will just have to <laughs> see how best we can work with the new leadership. But again, I have to make this very, very clear. I do not think, again, whoever emerges, whether the person is not Peter Obi, we also want to take Nigeria very, very lightly. Because this election will be an eye-opener for every political party in Nigeria. This particular election is going to be an eye-opener. Because uh, pol candidates now will be, uh, pol candidates and their political parties will now begin to understand that, look, it is no longer business as usual. If not, the replay, like uh, Tolu pointed out, the replay of the answers, again, might, there might be another second phase. And if there's going to be another second phase of the answer, it might, it, it's, going to be, it, it's, it, it's going to be more enforcing than the first one that took place. Because Nigerians are beginning to learn the game. Nigerians are beginning to understand the dynamics involved in the game. Nigerians, especially the youth, are beginning to understand that power indeed lies in their hands. Thank you very much. Thank you. Someone has to emerge as winner. And Mr. Elijah, we're looking at the young people out there who are always the first to be pushed in front. What do you have to tell them before we <laughs> come back to the expectation of whoever emerges as winner? What message do you have for young people out there, Mr. Elijah? Yeah, first and foremost, I want to give a hand of clap to all the young people in Nigeria. Honestly speaking, this election has shown that when young people are motivated, when they know what they want and their aspirations, and with the advent of social media, anything is possible. I'm not proclaiming that their candidates have won already or anything, but just the motivation in this election where young people took the bull by the horns, they did everything to get their PVC, they did everything to make sure that they were motivated for the candidates of their choice. Everything was all about social media and the government or INEC had nothing else to do than to yield or succumb to the aspirations of the people. So I do not think, you know, that is a lesson. That's something that um, the rest of Africa can learn from. 
Now, there's something I just want to clarify, and um, I want to not clarify, but uh, to look at the question, the process of uh, withdrawing a candidate or um, recalling a candidate. I just quickly look at the website of uh, INEC. They have explained on their website that 50%, if there is a, a request by 50% of the registered voters in that locality, whether it is a local area government or a, a representative house of assembly, if there is a signatory of 50% of the voters in that area, INEC is automatically going to initiate a recall. So let people know the power that they have. If you have an elected member that goes there and is trying to impede whatever the president is trying to do or whoever you elected is trying to do, you have the power in your hands to call for a recall. You just need to organize yourself and get 50% of signature of elected members in that constituency, send it to IMEC, and a recall is going to be initiated. So it's not a difficult process. So I just wanted to, add, you know, to point that out. Now, on the young people, what they can do. I mean, again, I said I congratulate the young people in this election in Nigeria. Their motivation to see that their vote counts. And in the past, we've seen politicians in Nigeria use huge sums of money to buy votes. I saw young people motivated and said, I am not going to sell my future for the next five years for 2,000 naira, 3,000 naira. I am not going to sell my vote for that. That is something that can be emulated in the rest of Africa. This issue of buying votes, especially from young people who are hungry, they give you a few bags of rice, give you a couple of dollars here or a couple of naira here, and you go and sell your future. This time around, we saw young people said, no to that. Not only that, we saw a president that stood up to stop any amount of vote rigging or whatever it is. That is something we have to give it to Buari, whether you like him or not. We saw him put in place strategies to hinder intimidation and vote buying and all whatnot. That is something we need to give it to, to Buhari. Not only that, we also saw that, you know, people were motivated to go beyond ethnic and regional lines to vote for a candidate that they feel that meet the aspiration. That is something we don't normally see in Nigeria elections. Even in Africa, that is an emulation and a, a pat on the back for young people to say, vote for somebody that meets your aspiration. It doesn't matter if he comes from your area or he doesn't come from your area. As long as he carries the aspiration and you think that he can carry the nation forward, please be motivated to vote for that candidate. That is a lesson for the rest of, I mean, uh, a lesson for the rest of Africa and young people as a whole. So I want to say kudos to all the young people. No matter who wins, the electoral process in Nigeria this time around is something that can be emulated all over Africa. Again, am I saying that there's going to be no issues here and there? Of course not. Even in the United States or in Canada, wherever you have real democracy, there are always issues. But those issues do not, at the end of the day, hamper democracy. And whoever will finally win, I mean, the law courts are there, there are many channels that can be used to make sure that the right candidate finally emerges the winner. So again, our young people stay calm when it comes to the result. Make sure that the right channels are used if there are any contentions. And again, this is an election that many other nations in Africa should learn something from. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Elijah. Indications, we have uh, a call online. Your life on the Pan African debate. Good afternoon and uh, welcome. Let's hear you. Your life on Africa Media. Let's get your reaction. Your life on call. Hello? Yes, your life on the program. Let's get your reaction, please. Bonjour. Uh, let's Vous get to le français? All right. Uh, thanks very much for trying to reach us. Uh, now, the, the expectation is equally uh, that which we uh, are serving Nigeria. Now, let's begin with you, Mr. Timothy. What do you expect from whoever uh, becomes the new president of Nigeria? If you had one request, and you had one wish, what do you think they should do? Security crisis, 
economic issues, unemployment, and all the rest. What do you think should be that first responsibility of whoever becomes uh, the president today, Mr. Timothy? Mr. Timothy, are you there? Can you get me? Yeah, like I said, this question is very, very fundamental. It's very, very fundamental because for me, I do not expect that the incoming president should begin to tackle things immediately. But what I would expect the incoming president to do is first and foremost, call for a credible, and I want to borrow the word from my distinguished senior researcher here, credible sovereign national conference. We need to sit down again. We need to sit down to talk. We need to sit down to tell ourselves the truth. We need to come back to the drawing board. We need to come back to a round table. So a president should first and foremost convey such a conference so that the outcome of that conference will now begin, that will now be the, the, the roadmap towards our path to reconciliation, <laughs> which is very, very important. Reconciliation, path to uh, 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 economic progress, path to social integration, and our path to a new Nigeria. Because if we don't come to this round table to talk, I want to take leave from John Rawls, uh, who talked about coming back to take the original position. What do we want Nigeria to become of? Who is a Nigerian? We need to define these terms. We need to understand these terms. We need to put a lot of things in place to ensure that people are identified by being Nigerians before any other thing else. Until these things are put in place, I can assure you, it is like <clears throat> beginning, I mean, it's like continuing the mistakes we have always made. In the past, we have had a lot of conferences, national conferences. The question is, to what extent have those conferences, those national conferences been signed into law? Something was signed. Then number two, the new president should look at the Nigerian constitution. We need to see how we can begin to, first of all, reduce the voluminous nature of the Constitution. <laughs> because when, when we're able to address certain fundamental issues in the Constitution, we're going to reduce the voluminous nature of the Constitution. And so therefore, to begin to talk about our Constitution, we should be a byproduct of the Sovereign National Conference. That is another part we shall be taking for genuine progress and credible uh, recovery in Nigeria. Or else, we shall keep battling with the same problem, insecurity. And I, I, I will not be surprised if, I will not be surprised if the new president of the country battles with another dimension of insecurity in this country. I will not be surprised. But because there are certain fundamental issues that need to be addressed that are underlying factors necessitating insecurity in Nigeria. So until we call for this sovereign national conference and constitutional reforms in Nigeria, the road to economic recovery, the road to political salvation, and the road to progress will be bleak. So therefore, my advice to the new president, call for a sovereign national conference. Let us talk. Let us decide where we are. And let us also decide where we want to go from here. Thank you. What do you think should be that primary responsibility of a new Nigerian president vis-a-vis -vis the present situation in the country? What is your message to whoever becomes president today? Sorry, okay. Uh, 
in my opinion, whoever becomes president has a lot has a lot to do on his hands. Mm. Like when you look at all the indices surrounding Nigeria's economic situation, in the last eight years it has worsened. Is it unemployment? Is it economic growth? Is it the issue of the exchange rate? Is it the inflation? Is it no matter the even level of insecurity, the number of people below the poverty line, like it's the situation is really bad. So anybody that comes in needs to come in with this suiting bomb to reunite the country. We've been divided along ethnic religious lines over sentiments in the last few years. I mean, like Dr. Timothy said, there are agitations from every group. And that's the first time I, I would see that as an adult in my life. As in, there were the IPOP in the last few years, there were the bandits and the Boko Haram in North. In the Southwest, there were the likes of Sunday Bo and his team who were talking about separation. So in the, in this election is why everybody has the issue of separation as taking the, the back burner. So anybody who comes in needs to be ready to unite the country. You need to come with a message of hope. The situation is bad. You have to acknowledge it. Things are, things are worse than they were <clears> previously. <throat> and you need to come with that. And for me, I also think the person needs to come and hit the ground running. You should have your plans in place. One major indice that showed Buhari was not ready for office back in 2015 was that it took him about six, seven months to appoint ministers, to even send the names of the ministers to the, House, to the Senate. So anyone who comes in needs to have his team from day one, needs to be ready to keep the ground running, and needs to be ready to solve the, mere, the serious problems we have. Of course, Rome was not built in a day. If you think our economic situation will be transformed in is here yeah, you are badly mistaken but the foundation has to be built and that's what we would expect of any any president that comes in another thing i would like to point out is i think we focus too much on presidential elections in nigeria to the detriment of the gubernatorial election and even the you know the leaders at the grassroots because they are actually the governments that would have more impact on the people so as Nigerians, we need to spread our focus where it should be. And that's my admonition, that anyone who comes in needs to be ready to come up with that message of hope and, you know, inspiration in the face of our current challenges. Thank you. We ended with you, Mr. Elijah Inoku. Uh, what do you think a new leader should focus on as a primary <clears throat> responsibility? Uh, we're looking at vote counting on the way in Nigeria after definitely a successful voting day. What do you think a new leader should uh, tackle? Let me, yeah. Let me pick on what uh, uh, Mr. Timothy and uh, Tulu said. You know, African countries for some reason or some African presidents for some reason seems to be afraid of what we call a national conference. A national conference is not a conference to divide the country. Let me make that clear. A national conference is not a conference to say, oh, you go this way, you go. A national conference is to look at the key burning issues that every country, I mean, every citizen needs to be looking at. Mm -hmm. The constitution of Nigeria is very complicated. And when it was revamped, it made it even more complicated and more challenging for people to understand who is a Nigerian, who is not a Nigerian. And because a president is there to garner the aspiration of the people motivate everybody to feel its own citizenship and become part of the economic development. The president is not going to be, you know, single-handedly develop the economy. When Nelson Mandela came to power, he said something. He said, if I come out of prison and I still hold the grudge that I had with the people that put me to prison, I am still in prison while being a president. He called for a national reconciliation conference which saw the white people came out of their closet with all their resources, the money that they were stocking in Europe and all over the world. They brought it back to South Africa and South Africa, all the black people in South Africa are running to South Africa because of the policies that Mandela put in place. When Paul Kagame became president after the genocide in Rwanda, he took the people that killed in their numbers face to face. He brought killers and the victims together under a national conference and reconciled the country. Today we have people that are streaming to Rwanda today. Black Africans that are streaming to Rwanda today because that man put a platform in place that everybody started feeling themselves as a Rwandan. Not as a Tutsi 
or a Wutu or any other minority group, they felt themselves as Rwandan first. This thing I'm talking about, motivation of everybody to feel that he's a Nigerian, it is something that feels like uh, it's imaginary, but it has an effect on the people. When you know that you are contributing and there is hope for you for the future, you are going to work your best. In fact, I traveled from Onitsha all the way through that road, from the Yoruba land to Igbo land to all the other ethnic groups. I'm telling you the truth that along the way, you thought that you are in th three different countries. When you're in Boru, Yoruba land, you do not think that you are in, actually in Nigeria. It feels like you are in different countries. You're in Igbo land, you feel like you're in an Igbo, Igbo country. You are in, in the north, you don't feel a sense of citizenry within the people. They look at themselves first as Yoruba, Igbo, Aousa, this. Before being Nigerian, a country that is ruled like that is bound to have a lot of fragmentation and the development will be tepid. So this issue of calling for a national conference to reconcile the people, it's very huge. Number two, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, I've been saying this right from the beginning, $16.8 billion is spent every year on security alone. Nigeria, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Cameroon, and all these other countries are topping the list in terms of the amount of their budget, the percentage of their budget that is being spent on security. When people feel that they are part of the development of the country, this money is going to be injected to economy because these security issues will disappear. They will no more be there. Number three, when you look at the subsidies that we talked about here, ladies and gentlemen, I mean people who are listening to me, when you look at the subsidies that economy, I mean government are pumping, it is because they are trying to alleviate poverty in a wrong way. If people were economically viable, you wouldn't need those subsidies to pump into the economy. That money will be channeled into the right sources and people will be able to be economically de dependent. So all those subsidies that government is trying to pump to the economy is because it's bad economics, it's bad management of the economy. So if the government can tackle these core issues, I'm telling you, the Nigerian economy is going to pick up. I mentioned agriculture, for example. Nigeria has the potential to be the number one country in the world in terms of uh, agricultural production, but they are nowhere to be found among the 13 because the infrastructure. In fact, how would somebody go and produce goods in a sector where he's not going to transport those goods to the market because there are no roads, there's no infrastructure, there's no nothing at all for him to develop. The Benue Basin, for example, that basin itself can feed the whole of West Africa, not just Nigeria, in terms of the uh, 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 agriculture. But it's being wasted. It's not being used. So what I'm saying is the government needs to target into the areas that are sapping the economy of the nation. And when once that is done, all the other things are easily solved. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Elijah. Thanks very much uh, for that uh, intervention. And uh, definitely, we're thanking all of you who took part in today's program. That's uh, where we are putting a cap on today's edition of the program, the Pan-African Debate. Our focus was the elections in Nigeria. According to information, vote counting definitely is on the way after an almost peaceful voting day, in the, which is in an exercise which, if, of course, is one of uh, the biggest uh, democratic exercises in the continent. Okay. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much, Mr. Elijah Nwoku. You are a researcher with Flix University on African Development. We equally had uh, Mr. Uh, Timothy uh, Doc Percy. You are uh, with the Department of uh, Philosophy with Veritas University in Abuja. You are joining us by Zoom. Thanks very much, sir, for your contribution. Mr. Tuluamini Adeyefa, you are an economist. You are equally part of the program. We equally appreciate your time, and we were not able to have uh, Mr. Gabri, who is equally a lecturer and with uh, Achievers University. We were not equally able to have Mr. David on the end due to connection issues. But we want to thank you so very much, just of you who took our time to follow the program. The information, of course, has been passed. We're expecting that uh, whoever wins puts in place all the expectations and meet the desires of, of every Nigerian. And whatever the outcome of the result, we're equally hoping that Nigerians should accept that and move on.
peacefully. On to then, we're going to come back here definitely to evaluate uh, the outcome of the results. Whoever wins, we're wishing uh, Nigerians all the best. On to then, more programs are yours on Afrique Media. It's a bye-bye for now. Thank you to our technicians and to those of you who are following us uh, via Facebook and equally back at home. We wish you a wonderful weekend. Stay tuned.